or good whatever time of day it is if you're watching the rerun. Hello, I'm Richard Vobes and this is a stream, a live stream, reading J.B. Priestley's English Journey. Uh, this is um, episode three of my readings, but we're actually still in chapter two of J.B. Priestley's English Journey, published in 1933. And for those people who've just come for the very first time, welcome along. Uh, let me just tell you that the English journey is um, <clears throat> being a rambling but truthful account of what one man saw and heard and felt and thought during a journey through England during the autumn of the year 1933. And I think it's worth just remembering the autumn of 1933 was a period of um, quite bad uh, depression. And I think part of his journeying through is to see how people are muddling through, pretty much as we are muddling through today. Now, it's become a bit of a tradition that I start with um, pouring myself a nice cup of tea with, and people have been uh, intrigued about the lovely teapot here. This was um, sent in to me by the lovely Lisa Fox, who is uh, watching at the moment in the middle of the night and likely to fall asleep as soon as I start reading. Um, we have beautiful English animals on there, or British animals maybe. Uh, we've got a squirrel, and I think that is a pheasant, uh, an owl, a fox, and another squirrel. Is that a red squirrel on the top and another, another pheasant or something? Uh, and it's one of those teapots that comes in half, as you can see. And uh, I'm banging in a bit of milk. It's interesting, the controversy about making a cup of tea. Bang in a bit of milk and we'll pour the tea before we start reading. This is the sort of little preamble, really. <clears throat> so, and as ever, I managed to spill the tea on the desk. So we're in the middle of chapter two. I'm reading. Hopefully the reading is going to get better. Sight reading. Um, and we'll see how we go. Uh, I'm not quite sure how long this little section is. We get into a little bit of chapter three, which is in the Cotswolds. So, but if you remember yesterday in the last episode, we were in Bristol and... Um, J.B. Priestley is about to leave Bristol. So let's um, let's crack on. Let me just move my mouse out of the way. <clears throat> just adjust my glasses so I can actually see the text. There was a train leaving Bristol at 9.40am. And as that is a good time to leave a city, and this train seemed to be going to any number of places, I caught it. After two or three stops, we arrived at Swindon, and there I got out. I'd never been to Swindon before, and all I knew about it was the Great Western Railway had its chief works there, and that it made the best railway engines in the world. After all, a town that makes the best locomotives in the world is a place of some importance, I argued. We ought to be proud of it. Swindon and its engines should be one of the feathers in our cap. It was my duty to have a look at this feather, to report upon its shape and colouring. The station I'd arrived at was Swindon Junction, and it offered me a taxi of sorts. I told the driver to take me to a hotel, and he drove me some distance through mean streets, finally climbing a hill and landing me at a hotel in what is called the Old Town. This is the Swindon that there was before the Great Western Railway came. A village of call, <clears throat> possibly a sketch of a market town. There was nothing remarkable in it, certainly not my hotel, which received me with complete lack of enthusiasm. I found the chambermaid busy trying to fasten the wallpaper to my room to the wall with drawing pins and was in time to indicate a few spots where a pin would be valuable. If drawing pins would have restored the paintwork, I would have sent out for another box. Then I washed myself among the chipped 
crockery in the corner, unpacked my bag and went out. The sun was still shining. I descended upon the new town, the real Swindon. My way went first down a long straight road that was obviously one of the newer enterprises of the town. It was lined on either side by tiny semi-detached houses of red brick. There were a great many of them and they were all alike, except in their little front gardens. Some householders fa favoured dahlias and Michaelmas daisies. Others preferred a bright geranium. All these gardens, though hardly bigger than a tablecloth, were flowering profusely. There is this to be said about the English people. Give them enough... Give them, an e give them even a foot or two of earth and they will grow flowers in it. They do not willingly let go of the country, as the foreign people do, once they have settled in a town. They are all gardeners, perhaps country gentlemen at heart. Abroad, the town, even though it is really only a small village, nearly always starts abruptly, brutally, at once cutting itself off from the country and putting on the dusty and flowerless look of a city. Here we take leave of the country reluctantly and with infinite gradations, from the glory of the rose beds and the dull parade of hollyhocks to the last outposts among grimy privet and grass, where perhaps a sooty aster still lingers. Find a street without a flower and you'll be sure that the English are in exile, still hoping and planning behind the lace curtain and the aspidistra for a time and place that will break into living blossom. There are, there are flowers in their dream. When the housing society I knew in North London installs former occupants of slum tenants into clean new flats, the windows of those flats are soon gay with flowers. A significant fact. I thought about these things as I walked down this long straight road. There was something miniature and monotonous about these houses, but the road was not bad. A life could be lived in it. I soon found, however, that I'd been looking at the newest and the best of these railway streets. A turn brought me into the 50-year-old re re region, the town proper. Here there were no gardens and the houses built in immense unbroken rows. There was a town, it was a town laid out for Victorian artisans who no doubt considered themselves lucky to be there. It seemed that I walked miles between these brick facades, forever the same height. Each street seemed exactly like the rest. Nowhere, nowhere did I see one house bigger or older or newer or in any way better or worse than the others. Everywhere the same squat rose. It was like wandering through a town of dingy dolls. There was nothing to break the monotony. If a number of bees and ants, cynically working in bricks and mortar, had been commissioned to build a human dormitory, they could not have worked with more desolating uniformity. The people who planned these streets must have been thinking and dreaming hard about the next world, not this one. It is the only charitable conclusion. Probably I could not have been walking here for more than half an hour at most, but it felt as if I had been hours and hours in it. When I at last came to a blank-faced shop labelled Pang Brothers Chinese Laundry, I was almost startled. What were the Pangs doing here? And what did they think of it? I ought to have stopped and inquired. I ought to have a sip of my tea. Hold on. Oh, very nice. The very next shop I came to, for now I was coming closer to the centre of the town, was one of those hotchpotch second-hand establishments you find in these places. One large window was filled with strange musical instruments, not only ukulele banjos and mandolins and flute hammers and the Kentucky trap drum outfits, but also real pigskin tom-toms, deep tone, and Korean temple blocks and beaters. And for a moment, 
I had a wild vision of all the people in the streets, headed by the Pang brothers, beating and beating away at these pigskin tom-toms and Korean temple drops. One night they would not stop at eleven and go on beating harder and harder until the sun rose and found that all the miserable little streets had gone. Among the tattered books in another window of this shop was one that I had not seen for many years, but I remembered it well for it had been published by a man whose professional reader I had been just after I'd first come to London, and this was one of the very first manuscripts that I had recommended to him to publish. Standing there so many years and miles away, I could see myself writing my report on that book, and now here was a copy of it, dingy and torn, a waif in a back street in Swindon, but alive, still alive, only waiting for somebody to put down sixpence so that they could, so it could say all over again what it had said to me in neat typescript long ago. The publisher, the publisher himself, was dead and gone. A bus or a back, a back, backless. I don't know what that is. A backless might remove me at any moment. And that book, which had made no stir in the world at all, would outlive the whole condescending crew of us. The only other article offered for sale in that street, I noticed, was a present for any good child, called Jolly Boy 2, quick-firing machine gun. See how quickly pellets are ejected. And as I walked away, I hoped that the jolly boys who played with it would never find themselves caught in the barbed wire with a stream of hot lead disemboweling them. The people who sell that toy might be encouraged to give away a few photographs showing what its parent toy can do with a man's guts. I came to the railway works themselves, at the bottom of the town, just as the men were coming out for dinner or at the end of a shift. A sturdy lot with blackened faces, much too sturdy and far too grimy for the dolls' houses they had to go to. I followed a crowd of them round a corner where I found a dismal little beer house, but only two of them were inside, having a pint with their bread and meat. It was here that I met a philosopher. He drifted in, a ghostly old scrap of humanity, wearing a black muffler, an overcoat too large for him, and a discharged soldier's badge, and he carried over his shoulder an odd-slung parcel bun bul bulging with bits of rope and thick twine. He ordered a mug of the cheapest beer, pointed to it and grinned toothlessly and mumbled, I always get the cheapest, see? It's the best. They don't put chemicals in it. Can't afford to put chemicals in the cheapest, see? Only put them in the best. That's how it is nowadays. I asked him what was, his pecu what was in his peculiar parcel. Huh, that's for mending mats, see, he said. That's what I do, mend mats. I go all over mending mats. Clubs, see, clubs. I'm affiliated. He added proudly. Sorry, I lost my space then. Yes. I'm affiliated. He never condescended to explain what he meant by being affiliated, but he had brought but he brought out the word as if it was a word of power, and the sound of it on his lips made his face a little less spectral. You never saw such a poor wisp of an old chap. His bones seemed to shine through his greyish skin. But he talked of his travels, for he was constantly on the move, finding more mats to mend with great air. Go from here to Newbury, then to Redden, then I Wickham, then London, see? Spend the winter months in London, Woolwich way. Good old Woolwich. That's where I spend the winter months. He was only a year away from his old age pension. Not married? I asked. Yes, he'd been married. Any children? I asked. I hadn't, but the wife had, he told me, winking rapidly with his left eyelid. Leastways, <clears throat> the first might have been mine. The other two wasn't. Had my suspicions about the second kid, along with a pal of mine who was always round, Frankie such and such. When the third comes, he was a spitting image of Frankie such and such. Here, I says to the wife, that kid's not mine. 
Oh, isn't it? she says. Well, who the hell's is it then? It's Frankie such and such, I says. And the next thing you know, we're separated and she's living with Frankie such and such up in Manchester. He told me all this with the humorous detachment of a true philosophic mind. He blamed nobody. That was the world we have to live in. Then, having proved his complete independence, he took interdependence of man for his theme. Sorry, another slurp of tea. All depend on other people, don't we? He concluded earnestly. That's right. And I don't care who you are. Rockefeller's got lots of money. And I haven't, see. But Rockefeller's got to depend on other people, hasn't he? Of course he has. Same as me. We all have. There spoke the affiliated man. And I left him with the price of several more pints as a small return for those sentiments. And if a little ghost of a man wearing a brown overcoat much too big for him offers to mend your mat, give him a job. Now I went up the main street, which was a poor thing, chiefly filled with cheap shops and sixpenny bazaars. There were plenty of women going in and out of the shops, for the men of the town were in steady work, building their famous engines. But you felt in but you felt that all the shoddiest stuff of Europe, America and Japan were being poured into this street. I had lunch in an eating house there, noisy with gramophone music coming from the wireless. Music at third hand. The prime dish of the day was roast griskin pork with two veg, one and threepence. It was dear at the price. The pork was nearly all dubious fat. The Brussels sprouts were watery, and the baked potatoes may have been made out of papier-mâché. I ate what bits I could, refused any more, and returned to the street, which looked much brighter after a visit to that eating house, and I walked up the hill to see the rest of the town, having heard, having heard rumours of a public park. I never reached the park, however, because it soon was raining hard. The other diners at the hotel that evening were commercial travellers of a more morose kind. But not far from me was a rather raffish-looking middle-aged man with his lady friend, and I'd never heard anything more dismal than their attempt at talk. He would slosh about his food and drink, and she, after racking her brains for something to say, would venture at last on a question. "'Where's Mabel now?' she would ask. "'Not really.' caring where Mabel was. At Brighton, he would grunt. She would work hard with this and finally say, I suppose she's staying at so-and-so's. That was all they could manage between them, and it made silence and solitude seem comparatively cheerful. I left them casting about for topics and hoped that as I, and hoped as I went that the rest of the evening would be a little livelier. There was rain in the streets, but every moment there were fewer drops, so I went out to see how the people who build the best locomotives in the world enjoy themselves on a damp night in early autumn. The dinner had been better than I expected, and now I was, quiet, and now I was quietly sinking into that mood of not unpleasant melancholy that comes to a man alone in a dark town. The main street was singularly quiet. Now and then a pair of lads would hail a passing pair of girls. That was all. The only lights shone from the three picture theatres of town, from pubs, which were poor places, and from a fish and chip shop here and there. These were not enough to take the murk out of the street, which had a, a, an unfriendly shuttered look. This, I said to myself as I wandered about in the dwindling rain, is one of the penalties inflicted upon you if you live in these smaller industrial towns where you cannot, where you can work but cannot really play. A town in which men worked hard all day at their giant engines ought to be glittering and gay at night, if only for an hour or so. This street should be ablaze with light. One ought to be able to look through the great windows and see triumphant engine makers with their wives, sweethearts, children, eating and drinking and dancing and listening to music beneath illuminations as brilliant as their furnaces. The street should be shaking happily with waltz tunes. 
Let those who are tired out, let the quiet and studious ones sit at home, but those who want light company, cheerful noise, gaiety, should have these things, for they have earned them. Think of the energy, the organisation, the drive of purpose required to construct the Cheltenham Flyer with its 80-odd miles an hour, or the energy, organisation and drive of purpose required to cram these Woolworth stores with the mass products of Czechoslovakia and Japan. Why, a minute, why a minute fraction of these could fill a dark street with light music and gaiety. So I told myself as I wandered about, after trying to reject, after trying and rejecting a pub or two, merely little boxes of smoke and the smell of stale beer. Just going to blow my hooter. Oh, I was going to blow my hooter, but my hooter blowing apparatus I may have left in the other room. I hope you're all enjoying this, by the way. A turning at the bottom of this main street directed me to the playhouse. It was not a bad building and would make an excellent little theatre. A depressing small audience, which could not muster more than a dozen at best, two shilling seats, was watching a touring review company. The scenes alternated regularly between song and dance affairs with the chorus and the badly rehearsed comic and badly rehearsed comic scenes, played by a very old comedian who kept forgetting the poor lines he'd been given, a middle-aged dwarf who was forever being pushed over, and a young man who had yet to learn how to be funny. The chorus were fit entertainers for all those... The chorus were fit entertainers for all those rows of squat houses, for they looked to me no more than four foot, four foot high, a troop of energetic but ungraceful dolls. There was one, however, different from the rest, intent on something more than jiggling for a pittance. She sang and danced for dear life. She alone turned herself into a Mexican, a vaguely oriental slave, a schoolgirl, a gollywog, a miniature banchetti, while others so clumsily and pitifully pretended. Her eyes were brighter, her feet nimbler, she entered eagerly and departed reluctantly. Her whole small being leapt up to answer the challenge of the floats and the two spotlights. And it was she, and she alone, who transformed that forlorn place into a theatre. She was really alive, she delighted in her work, she had gusto and she deserved a salute, this little chorus girl. I hope that she will dance her way, growing up all the time into whatever company, whatever theatre she wants. There are not enough of her kind, whether they're pretending to be gollywogs on the stage or pretending to be real people in the street. It was eleven o'clock and very dark and quiet when I returned up the main street on my way back to the hotel. What noise there was came from a fellow with no size in a raincoat who was very drunk. He was baying spasmodically. Old, old soldiers never die. And on his face when I caught sight of it under a lamp was a fixed look of faint surprise. He was reeling in a blazing world of self-esteem and colossal good fellowship, a world assured of the immorality, immortality, of old soldiers, and somehow, and here, and here he was surprised and soon would be deeply pained, he was alone in this world, for the passers-by who hurried off into the dark on their way home obviously cared nothing for good fellowship and the destiny of old soldiers. I saw him later as I waited for the bus to take me up the hill, and he was still baying his one line of song, but now there was a note of protest in it. Nothing wonderful had happened, no friends, no fun. And soon he would be sick somewhere, and it would be all over, and he would simply be a poor devil who'd taken on too great a load of beer. The only man sitting up in the hotel smoking room had probably had much more to drink, but he could carry it in more artful fashion. He made me drink some whisky with him before going to bed, 
He was a very red-faced, spluttering, middle-aged bachelor who had retired from some colonial murchasing business in the city to become a fantastic creature, a racing man. These, there was, there were some racing, racing, there were some races in the neighbourhood. He boasted to me, for he was very boastful humour, that he had made a great deal of money out of betting, but I didn't believe him. There we went, there he went, week after week, year and year out, following the races as hard as any bookie, and putting more time and energy into his elaborate Id idiocy, as he admitted, than he had ever done into his business. He complained of the endless hotel life, the crowded race trains, the bleak days on the courses, the tips that came to nothing, the bookies that vanished, the horses that he'd backed and had, w and had won only to be disqualified. Yet he was proud of himself, both as a sportsman leading a glorious life and as a mysterious, dutiful citizen who was somehow contriving that all these worries and expenses and mir miseries would work out for the common good. I, who admitted that I knew and cared nothing about racing, was to him a fellow who was merely crawling through life. Yet in all his talk, and there was plenty of it, he never dropped a phase that lit up his ruling passion and showed it quivering in delight. A hawker whose living demanded that he should drag himself to every possible race course who could have talked in the same strain as a sportsman who was alone in the world and had money and so that he could enjoy himself in a thousand different ways. The only explanation to this daft way of life, I suppose, is that years ago when he was a clerk in the city, and it obviously started as one, who read the sporting papers and ventured half a crown here and there, had come to the conclusion that the racing men were the lords of life, and so he had toiled and planned to turn himself into one. And now, here he was, going the same old round, boasting and grumbling and fiddling, filling himself with whisky, a full-blown sportsman, the ass. The porter, or boots, or general factotum of this hotel, was a shallow stripling with a snub nose and lugubrious, there's a word, lugubrious air, though quick and obliging enough. He didn't come from these parts. I asked him about his wages and prospects. He told me that he received 12 shillings a week's wages and averaged another 10 shillings a week or so in tips. And out of that, he added earnestly, I have to pay my clubs and my endowments. I've got three of them. I must have looked, in, I must have looked puzzled, for he went on, I think these endowment policies are the best way of saving your money and he had several endowment policies on hand. If they tell you that the youth of this country thinks only of today and is too free with its cash, remember this youth who might have walked out of Dr Smiles' chapters, perhaps in 10 or 15 years' time when the mysterious endowments have matured, he may be running his own big hotel, but I'm afraid that it may not be a very cheerful place. And uh, that's the end of chapter two. And I'm just going to do a little bit of chapter three, which is the Cotswolds. But I'm just going to have a top up of my tea. How's it all going, by the way? Not so many viewers as we've had in the last. So I guess if not so many people want want it, then I will cease doing it. Um, but anyway, chapter three, The Cotswolds. It's probably because I'm not a very good reader, really. I keep misreading. I've only got one eye. I'm using that as my excuse. After Swindon, I thought I'd make for The Cotswolds, the most English and the least spoiled of all our countrysides. So I went by road to Burford, the eastern gate of The Cotswolds. It was a day typical of that country, Damp and heavy, the sky a sagging grey roof with shreds and tatters of mist among the copses and in the long meadows. You seemed to catch glimpses of a marvellous hollow land. You saw hardly a soul between the villages. Burford, an old acquaintance, looked rather more self-conscious than it used to. 
as if too many people had buying picture postcards in it. The hotel was almost full. Most of the guests were middle-aged women, English and comfortably well-off, and the kind who are forever writing letters in the corner of the lounge. Having seen my bags deposited in a bedroom, carefully decorated and furnished in the very worst taste, I went off in a car to have a look at another of the certain villages that I remembered with particular pleasure. One of them was Bow Borton on the Water, which was a broad shallow stream running through it. Uh, sorry, which has a, a broad shallow stream running through it and over this stream a number of exquisite old stone bridges. I've often long thought of it and talked of it as the most enchanting village in England, but either my memory had been false uh, or the place is not what it was, for no longer did it seem to be the very best of its kind. It's still beautiful, especially when you su survey it from one of its delicious bridges, but there are too many poor buildings in it, clean out of the Cotswold tradition, and it's becoming very conscious of itself. I had tea in a studio cafe, an amusing little high room decorated with antique knick-knacks. Once, I imagine, it had a concern with agriculture or industry, then it was turned into a studio, and now it's a picturesque tea room, a sequence of some significance, but the tea I had was excellent, and cheered by it, I explored the valley of the slaughters. I thought these two little villages, Lower Slaughter and Upper Slaughter, beautiful before, and think them so still. They should be preserved for ever, as they are now. A man bringing a single red tile or yard of corrugated iron into these two symph symmetry symphonies of grey stone should be scourged out of the district. I call this... I call it grey stone, but the truth is it has no colour that can be described. Even when the sun is obscured and the light is cold, as it is as it was that evening, these walls are still faintly warm and luminous, as if they knew the trick of keeping the lost sunlight of centuries glimmering about them. This lovely trick is at the very heart of the Cotswolds mystery. It is this and not the green hills, the noble woods, the perfect flowering of architecture, that makes the villages so notable and an enchantment. If it were not for this, they would be beautiful, but cold and heavy, for Cotswold weather is often sullen. But not a sunny morning since the War of the Roses has passed here without conjuring a little of its golden warmth into these stones. Villages, manor houses, farmsteads, built of such magical material, do not merely keep on existing, but live like noble lines of verse, lighting up the mind that, preserves, that perceives them. How long these two slaughters will remain unspoiled? I'm probably hastening their ruin now by writing this. Cursed be the hands that defile them. After dinner in my hotel back in Burford, a fellow guest introduced himself to me. He was an ex-officer of the regular army, whose first serious novel I had once reviewed and praised heartily. We settled down to talk. He had just returned from taking his boy, and only an adored child, to his public school. The boy wanted to be a farmer, a fact that my acquaintance announced with pride and pleasure. His family, he told me, had been on the land either as farmers or owners for 800 years. Himself had no land now, had indeed been forced off it to into soldiering and authorship and other such dubious pursuits, and saw in his boy decision and satisfactory working of some hereditary principle. There was nothing, he declared, like being close to the land. I told him that as a child of the streets, of the hotchpotch urban and industrial life that he despised, and therefore I knew very little of the land. He was all in favour of me. He was all in favour, he told me, of the peasantry, a bold peasantry, their country's pride, and thought its re-establishment would be one cure for our ills. To this I replied, rather lightly, that the Though the theory always seemed attractive, I found myself mistrusting it because of the few occasions I come in contact with peasants, 
I had not greatly liked them, nor did they seem to be much admired by the more eager spirits in the very countries that cherished, cherished their, present, their peasantries. A peasant on paper, a romantic literary man's peasant, I hinted, was all very well, but always seemed a very different sort of creature from the actual, ignorant, stupid, mean peasant of reality. So we wrangled in a friendly fashion until it was time for bed. I mention this talk because it seemed to sound a sort of layout motif that was to my com that was to accompany me throughout this visit to the Cotswolds. Yet to my acquaintance, like me, who was merely passing through here, yet my acquaintance like me was merely passing through there in the hotel for only this one night, and there was no obvious reason why he should have started this topic, but there it was, the Leia motif, which I have no idea what that means. Maybe somebody could tell me. I have noted this. I have noticed this happening before, and every time it does happen, one feels that a pattern has suddenly, momentarily, been imposed upon the chaos of encounters and arguments and chatter. The next morning, I went from one entrance of the Cotswolds to the other, from the eastern gate to the northern, for my destination was Chipping Camden where the wolds narrow to a fine edge. The day was just right. There were shifting and broken mists below, and somewhere above a strong sun, which meant that the country was never seen in one blank light. It was one of those autumn mornings when every bush glitters with dewy gossamer. One moved mysteriously through a world of wet gold, nothing but boundaries or real continuity. Roads climbed and vanished into dripping space. A beech copse was near the end of an impenetrable forest. The little valleys were remote as Avalon. The villages arrived like news from another planet. As we went, we would startle and scatter hosts of little birds, linnets and finches, and even goldfinches, which flashed marvellously about us for a second and then were gone before we could really believe they were there. The trees, especially the great elms, still had indigo night tangled in their branches, but they would jump suddenly into the sunlight and show us their patches of dead yellow leaves. And sometimes the mist would retreat dramatically from one bit of ground, perhaps an orchard, and we would see a bough bright and ripe with apples. We might have been journeying through England of the poets, a country made out of men's visions. And at the end of our road was Chipping Camden, with not a wist of mist about it, full and fair in the sunlight. And that's where I'm leaving it today. You can't leave him there, Mr Derrick. Just about to go into the Cotswolds. I'm afraid I can. Uh, so, yeah, 20 viewers. <laughs> um, I don't know whether it's worth carrying on with that, but um, I just thought I'd read a, f a few bits of it. We'll see how we feel tomorrow. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and listening. If you have, do lead, leave a comment. Sorry if I don't uh, get back to you on the comments. I've had so many comments on the other video channels uh, that I run that um, because people are stuck in as we go through this coronavirus situation and lockdown more people are online and watching content so um i appreciate that people more there are more comments out than than normal anyway thank you for watching and i will uh, catch up with you sorry uh, the tea is repeating on it now um there'll be a vogue show tonight on the vogue show youtube channel if you care to join me and hopefully another video a bit later on. So take care, have a good Saturday, and I will see you anon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye for now.